have Vivian, if she's still with us. Oh, yes. Yes, she is, absolutely. Hi, Vivian. I'm here. Okay, so Vivian augmented intelligence, Vittorio augmented creativity. Uh, so there is a similar approach here. We are near term, we are technology collaborating and helping us to augment. Uh, for you with an angle on creativity, for Vivian with an angle especially on education, but, uh, but uh, uh, not only. In terms of the learning process, how, how, how does, does, that, does that work? When, when you start collaborating with the machine and then when you push the collaboration further, so when you get to the level of augmented X that each of you uh, pointed out, how does that work practically? Does it change the person? Does it change the machine? How are the forces at play there? Vivian, maybe first. So in my experience, uh, having played around with these sorts of tools for a while, uh, it does take a different approach. And, and to be clear, we're exploring hypothesis space. I don't, I don't think that this is a replacement, at least what we're doing, for solid traditional lab-based science. But we're able to explore so much space uh, by combining what amount to complex reinforcement learning algorithms with econometric models to plausibly model the, the causal relationships or the variables we're looking at. Um, but in the end, you know, our system doesn't truly understand the problems that it's solving. And so it requires us to step in and say, wow, there's some really interesting patterns here that now need a deeper exploration, that, that need a more mechanistic exploration. And that's maybe the, that, that last element, that mechanistic understanding of what's going on, that uh, our approach, for example, in education and chronic stress uh, are lacking. But that benefit of honing down on specific hypotheses that are really worth testing is powerful. Vittorio? Perhaps I can give you one example which yeah. simplifies all this. So we constructed a, an interactive installation, which is a physical installation actually built with uh, Lego bricks. So people are supposed to build a city with these Lego, Lego bricks, but it's not just a game because actually there are cameras and sensors monitoring what is going on in this city. There are color coding, each color is coding for a specific aspect of the city or the urban environment. And underneath there is a mathematical model which itself has been trained through data of existing cities. Okay. Actually, this is a mathematical model reminiscent. Actually, it's an Hamiltonian model in which we try to, to infer the coupling parameters. So the rules of the game, but not the, the patterns. So people are doing something, and then they get a feedback in terms of how good is the city in terms of certain number of parameters, quality of life, uh, uh, employment rate, uh, number of cars, pollution, this kind of stuff. And then they, they, they get missions. Can you reduce the number of cars in a city? And of course, there is no Lego brick for the number of cars. So you have to, to try to infer, I mean, which kind of actions you have to take in this complex space of parameters in order to get there. And the machine, of course, I mean, it's not now, but in the future can actually learn from these actions that can actually try to steer the movements of people in this space. So it's a, again, it's a sort of ping pong situation between the machine and the human being. But when we apply a problem like that, uh, so kind of creating let's simplify, a better city. Uh, and you, you put a machine and humans on it. Uh, then, of course, the machine has gigantic computational power that we don't have and so on. But uh, is, is there a, a risk that we are essentially only looking at the city from the perspective of what can be measured and therefore what can be translated into algorithmic data and we are not looking at the other set of issues? Of course, I mean, th there is always this problem of the bias. This is, uh, is general, it's still, it's still unsolved. But still, I would say that this, is, uh, this kind of object should not be thought as a sort of decision theater. So you go there and you leave with a solution. These are supposed to be awareness machines, so for humans to get ideas. I mean, in front of this machine, I've seen discussion of people saying, I would do this. No, 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 I would do this. This would be better for this, this reason. And then I said, okay, why don't you try out this? So this is a way to make hypotheses for yourself and then try out this hypothesis, according, of course, to the limitation of the machine so far. But still, I would say the machine is limited, human beings not, and if you get a sort of uh, uh, nudge to get the right idea, this, I guess, is enough. Vivian, you... know you the... Yes, go ahead. Uh, 
if I, if I might uh, yeah, yeah. expand on that, it, it's interesting because one of the criticisms, particularly of modern machine learning, deep neural networks, is that they're a black box. They're so complex, we don't really understand what they're doing. But by actually creating these closed loop experimental systems, it reveals, if not the motivation, for lack of a better word, and that's a terrible one, but the lack of a motivation behind the experiment, you still see the experiment. You see what what the result of this experiment was. So if our system repeatedly nudges individuals to uh, increase their daily walk by 10%, then that allows my team to then explore that as an independent causal re relationship to let's say ischemic heart disease. Admittedly, that's something we already know, but what's interesting is, is heterogeneity. Uh, science generally takes specifics and generalizes them into a general theory. But then we have this assumption, we can take that general theory and apply it back to the specific instances. What in fact we see is almost everything that emerges from our analysis, that extra 10 minutes of walk every day helps most, but not all people. Uh, increasing your openness to new experiences decreases stress for most, but not all people. And, and understanding that those unique heterogeneities, particularly given work mm -hmm. I've done in the past, for example, using AIs in hiring, which is highly ethically complex and induces all sorts of problems. If you cannot causally say why this specific person should be hired or not hired, you shouldn't be using that system. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think we, we have the chance to look at science in the same way. Okay, we just have one minute left, and uh, Vivian, forgive me, but I cannot resist. Uh, <laughs> behind you, you have your book on Machiavelli for Women. Is there anything Machiavellian in AI? Well, you know, I, I actually loved, uh, as imperfect as it is, the movie Ex Machina, and, and just the idea that an intelligent system, uh, pro possibly even absent self-awareness, but with the right cost functions, uh, might be able to somewhat psychopathically uh, manipulate us and uh, induce our, our own end. It's certainly people's classic fear about artificial intelligence. Although I have to say, boy, I wish we had that problem. I, I, at least as a, someone developing AI, uh, the fact that I can't get the damn thing to do the stupidest and most simple thing most of the times, I wish I had a super intelligent AI that actually worked. <laughs> Uh, then we could solve the Machiavelli problem. Okay, some, some grounding here, it's very welcome. Thank you, Vivian, enjoy the rest of the day in California. Vittorio, thank Thanks you for being with us.